Noah, who can tell a little bit about what ACP is doing, how this is relevant uh, for that work, and also a little bit about uh, the testing that we did. Great. Thank you, Douglas. And thank you to all those that are on the, on the webinar. I can see several of the staff from some of our partner aquariums that were participating in this, um, this effort. So there's a lot of experience and expertise, not just that I'm trying to relay, but also from some of our audience members as well. If you could advance the slide, Douglas. So ACP is a consortium of 22 aquariums nationwide, um, coast to coast, inland states, and we're working collaboratively to advance conservation goals. Just to quickly summarize just a couple of them, uh, if you advance to the next slide. Uh, so we're working on a range of issues and the focus on marine protected areas, which has really been the focus under the hardwired work, uh, falls under the increased protections for ecosystems and wildlife. Um, so collectively, we've been doing a lot, um, but this opportunity for ACP members in partnership with the Ocean Project provided a chance to test out the hardwired framing to translate these messages with our visitors and to test that um, across four of our institutions. So this was an incredibly valuable opportunity, not just from the vantage point that I sit at here in New York at the New York Aquarium, but also through ACP. So we were very grateful to participate. If you could advance the next slide. So what, what you're looking at here is a photo of the New York Aquarium's Canyon's Edge exhibit. Um, Hudson Canyon, uh, an ecological hotspot about 100 miles from New York City, is an important place ecologically in the region and has been an important place for New York and New York Aquarium um, work, especially. You know, for the last five or six years, we've been engaging our, our audiences uh, with messaging and actions around Hudson Canyon. Um, including policy actions. And this, this opportunity with, with the Ocean Project and Heartwired provided a chance to test those messages, to adapt the framing, and to see how best it could be applied. Um, and one of the key sort of tools that we used drawing on the report was the Heartwired Redemption Framework. Um, so we, we opened up a series of, and this was our education team, giving talks in front of this exhibit for visitors who could just walk through. Um, and we, we closed the, that educational talk with the redemption framework where we, we talk about how Hudson Canyon is a unique and special place teeming with ocean wildlife as we tried to illustrate with the exhibit, but that the area faces serious challenges and threats from human activities, including potentially oil and gas development. But really the, the the, the helpful paradigm through Heartwired was to pivot to how collectively um, together visitors and the aquarium can work to protect important places in the ocean like this. And that we invited aquarium members and visitors to join us in that effort. Um, and, and we did that through an action, you know, similar to what we've done in other, in other campaigns, but with the ability to really test that out. Um, we had kids doing drawings that were ultimately delivered um, to our, our, our congressional champions. Um, but what, with, with the analysis and support from the Ocean Project, I think some of the messages and lessons that really stood out for us were, first, that our visitors are interested in ocean conservation, but they, they don't necessarily know a lot, um, especially when it comes to marine protected areas. Um, and that the Heartwired framework um, that resonated uh, with visitors and the messaging correlated with increased understanding and support for marine protected areas. And importantly, especially in New York and many of our uh, institutions around the world are, fo are focused in urban areas where there's um, a really diverse audiences and the hardwired messaging resonated regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, you know, characteristics that we're, we're trying to reach a wide audience. Uh, and then finally, the other key point um, was that the entree for us, for our visitors, uh, are the animals. And that's really how we've tried to frame this um, experience at the aquarium. But so it wasn't necessarily surprising. But if you pivot to the next slide, um, why that's really critically important is that especially post pandemic or during the pandemic, rather, we've, we've like many institutions have pivoted to much more engagement online. So after we 
completed the project separately, we were able to take the banners, and this is a, a tweet that the aquarium posted, when I was able to deliver the banners and the drawings to Congressman Serrano's staff. He's been our champion uh, for Hudson Canyon, and we were thanking him for his long-term leadership in support of uh, the sanctuary program and, and helping protect special places like Hudson. And, you know, engaging our audiences online now, we're thinking about how can we translate the lessons from Heartwired. And so, especially during COVID, I think there's an opportunity through this forum and others to, to think about how online messaging what the message retention is, how we can spur actions, and what, um, how, how the Heartwired framework um, can, can be advanced, especially when we don't have the exhibits or that direct one-on-one -on -one personal connection to the wildlife and the habitats that we're trying to describe. So with that, I wanted to pass it off, pass it back to Douglas, um, but happy to answer questions later on. Uh, thanks, Noah. Thank and uh, what I wanted to do uh, now is uh, transition over to Robert. Uh, for those of you who, who are interested in learning more about the project that was done uh, at those four aquariums with the Ocean Project, there is a nice blog post. I'm going to ask uh, one of my Ocean Project colleagues if they could put that in the chat. It really summarizes the details there. Some of the larger lessons and the research that was done that we were able to apply really does come from and credit due to the good work that Robert and his colleagues did on Heartwired uh, to Love the Ocean. So uh, what I wanted to ask you guys just quickly is, um, let's see if I can get to poll two. Um, just to give Robert a little sense, I was curious as to, uh, this is anonymous by the way, uh, how much of you uh, how familiar you guys are with this report so that Robert knows how to direct his comments a little bit. So let's just take a little bit of, uh, uh, fill, go ahead and fill that in just to help Robert know, uh, know his audience a little bit better. That's something we always uh, talk about is the importance of knowing your audience. And uh, while that poll comes in, Robert, let's see, I think we're gonna get our results here uh, pretty quickly. It looks like we've got about half of the people who have, are familiar with the report and about half who are pretty new to it. So that gives you a good um, sense of, of how we're coming in, uh, how, where our audience is in terms of this report. So it's great. We're going to have some people who are, who are a little familiar with it and also some who are going to get some new information today. So uh, let me sh um, there that shows people where we are. Great. And, uh, let me get out of the poll and transition over to you, Robert. And uh, thank cool. you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for the great work that you do to, um, to make the, the, not just the ocean accessible to, um, to people and to families across the United States, but um, to help communicate about the value of our oceans um, and the importance of, of conservation and protection work. Um, I'll just say uh, a few sentences about, about who I am and, and what I do. So you saw in the previous slide, um, I'm, the, I'm the founder and chief exploration officer of Wonder Strategies for Good. And what that weird title means is that I uh, try to get inside people's uh, job title, that is try to get inside people's heads and understand what make what motivates them, what makes them click. And I do that on, on a range of social issues, especially issues that are socially sensitive or socially controversial, but certainly any issue that um, is um, emotionally complex and anything where you're asking people to do something, to take an action, to donate money, et cetera, that's an emotionally complex um, decision. And it was, it's, uh, it's with that um, framework that we approached uh, this project um, that ultimately came to be known as Heartwired to Love the Ocean. And I'll say a little bit more in the coming slides about what it means to be Heartwired. Uh, but this uh, Heartwired to Love the Ocean is this messaging guide for, act, uh, for activists and advocates. Um, it includes uh, a synopsis of audience insights of what we learned. And we really, um, went in depth to understand across a diverse uh, range of characteristics 
how people are hardwired to love the ocean. Um, diverse in terms of race, we have a lot of depth in terms of race and ethnicity. Probably one of the biggest samples um, among Black and African American people in the United States, uh, Native and, and Indigenous people in the United States, uh, Latino and Hispanic people in the United States, Asian Pacific Islander people in the United States, um, and white people in the United States. And, um, and Heartwired's actual guide uh, actually only covers a portion of it. In fact, we're going to probably be doing a webinar um, in the fall to help people understand at a deeper level the differences um, across gender and the differences across race and ethnicity. Um, the guide also includes messaging recommendations. So knowing what we know about, uh, about people and their relationship to the ocean, how should you communicate? Now, uh, the good news, and I will, I will talk about this on the next slide, the good news is that people across, um, and, and I just wanna echo what Noah was presenting, people across um, age demographics, racial and ethnic demographics, gender demographics, there are important nuances and differences, but by and large, there's broad and deep support for protecting the ocean. So unlike a lot of the other issues that we work on um, that have included winning marriage for same-sex couples in the United States, helping people to understand who transgender people are, that are really emotionally fraught and very um, can feel very controversial to folks. This doesn't feel controversial to folks. Uh, and at the same time, the way that advocates are communicating about the ocean and the need to protect the ocean, it doesn't always uh, take um, full advantage of the pre-existing values and belief systems that people have to motivate them to take action. And with that, um, I, and I will, on the final slide, give you a, a, a link to where you can download the guide. Uh, but let's go on, um, Douglas, to the next slide. So, if, if, you know, it, it seems that some folks have had a chance to read it. Some folks have had a chance to skim it. But most, for a lot of folks, this is uh, Hardwired to Love the Ocean is new. So I'm going to do, I'm going to attempt to give you the Cliff Notes version of what you can find in the and like the 60 page guide that you can download for free. So one of the main findings um, that, we, um, that we uncovered in this research is that there are a set of pre-existing mindsets that have the ability to motivate people to take action, to shape their attitudes related to ocean and ocean conservation and to take action uh, to protect the ocean. Um, let me first begin by unpacking what, what does this thing heartwired mean? So that is um, our approach to both the research, audience research, and messaging. And what we have come to learn is that on, on the big issues of the day, people make decisions based on five, what we call five heartwired factors. Their emotions, their values, their beliefs, their identity, and their lived experiences. And I want you to think for a moment, to stop and think of, for a moment uh, on something that you have, you're like, I am certain, I believe in this thing, you, maybe it's the ocean and the fact that we should have strong laws to protect the ocean. It is likely that, that most, if not all of those five heartwired factors are in alignment. But think about something that you're not as familiar with, that you may feel is controversial or where your inner monologue is. On one hand, I think this, but on the other hand, they also think this, and you're not really certain, and you're, you feel a sense of internal conflict. It is usually the case that one or more of those hardwired factors is creating a internal emotional friction. And what we do in our research is we try to understand uh, and listen to understand the ways in which people are hardwired in order to develop strategies that align with the good people that they that that most people um, on the planet. Um, uh, hope to be, unless you're a sociopath or a psychopath. Most people do try to be good people and have, have amazing capacity at being good people. So we identified these five um, pre-existing uh, heart-wired mindsets, and they probably are pretty self-explanatory. The few things I want to say about them is that they're, they are pre-existing. They are there in people's minds. Uh, based on their, their lived experiences, their values, their beliefs, but they, um, they're like electricity behind a wall. The electricity is there, 
but unless you plug your good communications into the wall, you can't actually benefit from the electricity that, that's there. It's almost as if it is, it is dormant. So what this means is it's important to understand what these mindsets are and then how do you use, um, how do you use effective communications to flip the switch and to turn on these mindsets in order for people to, um, to do the things that we, that we want them to do, to, to be the good people that we want them to do. And the example that Noah described is an example of flipping the switch in an effective way to get people to do what they want them to do. Um, so those, these six um, pre-existing, we call these the primary mindsets, there are others, but these are really those that rose to the top and, and, and garnered the broadest support. So I'll just describe each of them. For the first one, the all senses mindset, the motivation there, is this sense that when someone arrives at the ocean, and I should say that many people's relationship to the ocean is centered at the beach. And so when you think about your communications, uh, beaches are great photographs and stories to lift up. And so the motivation is that I love feeling the sand between my toes. I love the sound of the waves, the smell of the salt air, the sights and taste of being at the ocean. This is the most um, prominent mindset that we that we discovered in research. Uh, people describe sort of like the stress of maybe getting the family to the beach, but as soon as you get there, the, the stress starts to melt away. The God's beautiful mindset, uh, God's beautiful creation mindset is the second most prominent. It is also probably the one that the conservation movement feels the least familiar with and probably the most uncomfortable using. I just want to name that. And that may be because um, a good chunk of folks who are in the conservation movement maybe identify as progressive or liberal and they're uncomfortable with sort of public displays or communication of faith. Or maybe because you've seen the way that faith has been weaponized against progressive causes that you care about. But the broad um, but if you are interested in diversifying your, um, your communications and your out, diversifying the people who are connected to, the, to your mission, this is a really great um, way to, to communicate with these folks. Um, you reach not just folks like white conservative Christians, but you reach um, black Christians as well who tend to be more, dem who tend to be more um, uh, let's say blue in their voting habits, uh, but they're not necessarily a natural, have not necessarily been a natural constituency for the conservation movement. The amazing wildlife mindset is this idea that the ocean is filled with the most amazing wildlife on the earth. And this is one that you all do really, really well. Um, you evoke awe in your communications. And I think you all have um, some lessons to give to the rest of the conservation movement on how to do that. Uh, what we've learned is not just to show the cool critters um, that you work with, but to show human, um, the human experience of awe in seeing these cool critters. So we have these things in our, in our mind called mirror neurons, where we, where we think mentally with other people. Um, we, we, you've probably been in an experience where you, someone's yawned and you've yawned. That is, those are your mirror neurons um, activating. And so what we know is that when you see someone who is like this, this look of awe on their face, um, that's going to create awe for someone else. And so it's not just showing the critters, it's showing humans experiencing uh, the amazing wildlife that live above the ocean and below it as a way to get other people to experience awe as well. The laws and mind, uh, policies mindset is uh, used a lot in the conservation movement. Uh, there is strong support for, for laws and policies to correct the ocean. However, it is usually the starting point for uh, where people begin their communications uh, in conservation circles. And what we would argue is build an emotional experience first with uh, these other mindsets, and then make the case that we need laws and policies. Uh, the feeling of peace mindset is just the sense that it's one of the few places that people feel genuinely at peace. Um, I described earlier on how it could feel very stressful maybe to get the family to the ocean, but then once you're there, the sound of the waves, the smell, 
It just puts you at peace. Um, for uh, a lot of evangelical Christians, this was a very high, um, a high pre-existing mindset. And our theory on that is that the other place where they feel deeply at peace is in church. In fact, we even had one person said, there, there are two places I feel really peaceful, the ocean and in church when I'm praying. Um, so interesting on how you can reach um, diverse audiences. And then the finally, finally the, the, tr the family traditions mindset, um, which is essentially, we heard stories and stories of people's first memories being at a place and how they created traditions with their families when they started their families to bring people to the same places or just to bring people to the ocean to experience the ocean, to fish, and to do all the things that they did um, when they were kids. Um, why don't we go to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna race through these last um, two slides. Um, as Douglas mentioned, we have 25 people that we have given grants to either in the form of cash or in the form of technical assistance. And these are the people who we um, are supporting. And they're doing really interesting things. Um, the Hispanic Access Foundation is working with Latino faith leaders to build greater su uh, support for ocean protection in their communities. Um, the Post Landfill Action Network is, do is working to get campuses to go completely plastic free. And that succeeded at, 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 at getting a few campuses to already do so, and they're working to, to grow that list. Um, the, the folks at Friends of the Mariana trench uh the north the the monument that is there in the northern mariana islands um can be very controversial for people who um who are on the islands and in particular native communities and indigenous communities on the island and and the folks doing conservation work have thought that they have been very much on the defensive um in doing this work and in the work that we've been doing with them they're reclaiming um the frame and taking away from the from the industry group um, on the reasons why protecting the ocean is about protecting native traditions that everyone loves. And that gets me maybe to um, a lesson that I think we are learning in doing this research. And it's something that Douglas asked me to, to like mute on and to maybe share with you like what have you what have you been learning? And what I have been learning is that we do a lot of these presentations and people nod and they say, yes, I get it. And then when it comes to going back to communicating, we tend to rely on our muscle memory to communicate and we go back to what we are familiar with. And what I am seeing um, at the beginning when I begin working with groups is that people, we have these two parts of our brain. Um, this is in Thinking Fast and Slow from Daniel Kahneman. Um, system one thinking and system two brain, uh, thinking. Um, system two thinking is, uh, is our rational mind. That is, it takes a lot of, of deep reflection and hard thinking to arrive at a conclusion. And system one is driven by emotions and habits. And, uh, and because thinking with system two is so energy sucking, we rely a lot on system one to make a lot of decisions. In other words, emotions draw are, is a emotions are a primary driver of our decision making and help to shape our attitudes and our behaviors. But the communication that we do as advocates often exclusively focuses on communicating to the system two mind. And so the lesson would be uh, to think of ways to evoke emotional responses in the way that you shape your communication. And the best way to do that is to think about these six primary um, ocean mindsets and ask yourself the question, how might our communication activate one or more of these ocean mindsets in order to shape people's attitudes and their behaviors? Um, on the next slide, I just wanna note that um, for anyone who um, is interested in knowing more and even maybe leading training sessions within your organizations or within your movements, we are going to start at the end of this month a three-part series for activists and advocates to train people to know Heartwired to Love the Ocean um, deeply and to lead uh, trainings and workshops with folks. Um, within your organization. So it is a, it's a three-part series. 
meaning um, not that you can choose the one that you want to go to, but it is um, all an all-in option. So if you are interested in it, the idea is that you would um, attend um, all three of the sessions. And I think with that, I think the last slide is just uh, a note of where you can get the guide. Um, you can get it at heartwiredforchange.com slash ocean. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me. Thanks so much, Robert. And maybe could you do me a favor and just throw that link also into the chat as we're talking here? Uh, so that people, I'm happy to do that. And then I'll move on to the next slide. Um, yeah. Actually, in the, because I know we're coming up at the end of the half hour, uh, let me plug a uh, plug in for the other another opportunity and then we'll come back and do question and answer if if for people who have questions, please go ahead and put any questions you might have uh, to Noah and or Robert into the chat. Um, just a, a quick plug. Um, the, the next of these webinars will be on Friday, September 4th. Uh, a lot of what we did and learned out of Heartwired to Love the Ocean is very applicable. We're finding to other issues related issues in this case. Uh, the, the movement that's really going really big that you've heard about on some of these webinars for others who've joined us, that is on uh, 30 by 30, the commitment now part of the official democratic platform, uh, now also committed to by the European Union to protect 30% of lands and waters by the year 2030. So stay tuned for that. We're in the process of developing a little information guide for uh, zoos and aquariums too about of the role particularly within that movement that zoos and aquariums can play. Uh, now let me go um, back to <laughs> uh, questions. And I see one here from uh, Robert, this looks like it's directed to you from uh, uh, Sarah Edmonds. And uh, if maybe what you can do is, uh, why don't I, it's a longer question. So let me ask a quick question that, to Noah and then uh, allow you to digest that and come back to you, Robert. So my, my question for you, Noah, was, um, one, of, uh, one of the things that you mentioned was the ability that the, the messaging that you tried, you found it worked across uh, different folks, uh, whether regardless of age, uh, ethnicity, gender. How do you balance out the idea of being sensitive to different people's perspectives and opinions with the reality of not being able to say, Democrats over here, Republicans over there when doing messaging. So uh, how are you finding, how are you putting that into practice or how would you recommend others do? Um, well, I think in general, we, we approach ocean issues as bipartisan and that the audiences we serve and work with at our aquarium as well as the zoos, you know, we're reaching people from all over the world, all over the country, all over New York City and the region. Um, I think, you know, if, if I were to channel some of my colleagues from the education department or the um, the graphic arts department or exhibit department, which were actively involved in this. Excuse me, there's a, a car racing by my apartment at the moment. Um, you know, I think we, we try to rely on, I think, on the frame of that ocean wildlife frame and then also that experience frame of just the sort of at peace, at, you know, the impressiveness of the ocean to, to reach a common sort of a sense of excitement. Um, and and not, while we engage in policy work, we don't think about it in terms of the, you know, the, uh, as a party fault line. You know, there's opportunities to work with Republicans and, and Democrats. All right, and uh, Robert, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to read through uh, Sarah's question, but let me uh, it's in the chat rather than my reading it. It's in the chat for people to look at it, but it's asking for a, a look at Heartwired in comparison to the Gnocchi uh, project that I think many of, of, of those on the line are, I know about. Well, first, uh, an amazing acronym. Um, Gnocchi is delicious. Um, so it's, I, I'm glad that you're seeing similarities. And on, on the question that you asked, um, and I'll just, I'll, I'll try to paraphrase um, what, um, what Sarah is asking, which is uh, that in the training that she's done, that this, this idea that talking about um, the stuff above the surface, either whether it be just the critters above the surface or in particular the beach, um, is unproductive. I would want to know more about the nature of, of what, they, what they have, what the research says. So I, it's difficult for me to comment. What I can comment is what is what we um, is what we learned 
about um, in our research, not just in this research, but in general, what we've learned about shaping attitudes and behaviors on really tough social issues. And that is that one of those five hardwired factors that I named earlier is lived experiences. And, uh, and the reason it is important to tap lived experiences is because often the way that advocates, communi ad advocates and activists communicate about an issue can be very emotionally distancing for the people whose, whose attitudes and behaviors you are working to appeal to and to, and to ultimately to shift. And so what we try to do is to tap pre-existing value systems, pre-existing belief systems, and in particular to tap pre-existing lived experiences. And one of the reasons why this project is markedly different than some of the other issues that we work on where there is a, a deeper social divide is that people have a lot of shared lived experiences that are, that are deeply positive with the ocean and in particular the beach. And that is an entry point. And the way and the reason that it worked in the communications that we did is because um, it, it helped to eliminate what is otherwise uh, very distancing language that um, that advocates um, can sometimes use. And again, it appeals more to the system one brain to frame the issue. And I want to make sure that that I, to clarify and be clear, it's important to speak to both system one and system two, and it usually is a back and forth experience that people that people have, um, where they they first have an emotional reaction to something, and then they start to engage, and then their their rational brain, their system two thinking starts to engage, and their rational brain is often shaped by the emotional gut reaction that they are having, and so the degree to which your communications can do both. But that begins by wrapping what you're, you're doing and communicating in a way that is deeply emotional, you'll have a better chance at shaping their rational thinking on an issue. Uh, I would you. love, and maybe Douglas, as, as a follow up, I would love to be to learn more about this research to bed to be able to better answer this question in the future. Yeah, that's, that's great, Robert. And I was going to suggest it would be wonderful to have somebody from Yoki join uh, the, the ends of the projects can be a little bit different too. I mean, the, one of the things that like, we were looking at, I know in our field testing was we were looking at the idea of inspiring conservation action and we weren't really looking as much at did people uh, learn more. We actually saw that people didn't know about marine protected areas and ended up learning about marine protected areas, but that wasn't necessarily the, the, the building knowledge wasn't necessarily the, the primary focus. There's a nice comment that I wanted to share that came in to the panelists um, uh, from Jim Wharton. And I would love, Robert, for you in particular to respond to this. It says, we often try too hard to get people to want to save the ocean for our reasons, but these mindsets could be helpful for helping conservationists allow others who want to save the ocean for their own reasons uh, without having to own, in quotes, those reasons themselves. And I, I just wanted you to maybe speak to that, this idea of, whether or not you meet people with the reasons that, that they love the ocean versus trying to convince them to care about the same things you do. Because that seems like a really, yeah. I know the research touched a lot on that. It does, and, it, and it's core to how we do our work. And, and let me say this, is a really, this can be a really challenging um, idea for activists and advocates. And that is the idea that um, getting people to support it for who they are, not for the reasons that they support something. So a, a core um, principle that we always lift up in the work that we do is asking ourselves the question, am I meeting the emotional needs of the audience with whom I'm communicating? So we probably have all had like the blank, you know, Google Doc or Microsoft Word Doc open, and you ask yourself, okay, what do I want to say? And what I want to do is I want to encourage you to flip that question to this. What does my audience need to hear in order to be persuaded? And it, and it fundamentally changes the way that you communicate. But to just show you how um, there's an anecdote from way back in, in my years around protecting wetlands um, in the San Francisco Bay against a decision that the mayor at the time wanted to expand the runway into 
um, into the Bay. And so um, a firm was hired to do research. And uh, what, there, were, there were good reasons, as you, I don't need to convince you, to protect the wetlands, um, including an endangered frog that, that lived there. And, um, and so the research team comes back to the advocates and says, um, we've got research. We, we know how to kill this, um, this effort to expand into the bay. And so the advocates were so excited and they're like, tell us, tell us. And they said, all you need to do is communicate about how much more traffic it is going to create around the peninsula because of more expansion for more airlines to come into, into San Francisco. And that, that is like, that was a non-starter for everyone in our focus group. And, and then this firm looks at the advocates and they're like, they're like this, they're like slumped at their seats. And they're like, what's going on? And they're like, well, we want them to do it for the frogs. And so, uh, yes, I want them to do it for the frogs, but, um, but the goal is of course to make progress. And I will say that progress um, begets progress, which is this, this, this short-term victory using a frame that resonates with the audience may eventually actually get you to the longer term um, victory. One of the things that we've learned on the work that we've done for many years on communicating about marriage or same-sex couples is that we learned surprisingly, this is contradictory to what we thought. We thought that we would have to, we would have to convince audiences to accept the moral legitimacy of same-sex relationships. And what we learned is that um, we didn't actually even need to go that far. We just needed to show how not just same-sex couples were hurt, but how families, um, the, how gay couples' families wanted them to be married as well and the harm that it created. And it was enough to get people who were conflicted to be able to say, you know what, I don't want to, I am a good person. I don't want to harm, harm, cause harm to these good people. So therefore I'm going to support it. But what we've seen is that there has been a lot of growth and depth of support on this issue by actually just getting the victories to begin with, by winning at the ballot box we've gone from losing 31 straight times in a row to a place where 60, between 62 and 67% of Americans support marriage or same-sex couples. Mm -hmm. One thing, if I might oh, ask, no. really, I think Robert, the description you had about listening, basically listening to our audience and finding common ground resonates. I think from WCS's perspective, we've, as we've tried to shape some of the activities uh, where we ask people to engage, we try to design them in a way that allows for creativity and opportunities to design their own message within and really elevate their voice as on the platform of the aquarium without constricting it. That, that obviously means that at times we don't always agree. Uh, and that's part of what it means to build a movement for conservation is like finding common ground. Um, but I think that's sort of the realization that we might have one sense of what might resonate, but the, the, the diverse audiences that we reach have many different ways to connect. Um, and so providing as the tools for that action, you know, we, we didn't say draw something specific. We said draw what, what resonates most with you about Hudson. Um, and so there were drawings about, you know, fishing, there were drawings about uh, sharks, there were drawings about, you know, the, your cell phone because you have deep sea cables that connect the internet uh, from New York to the rest of the world. So we, there are many ways that people could find that uh, connection. Uh, and we needed to make that platform for them as well. I love that example. And, and I will say psychologically what that is doing is it's actually helping to either help audiences to form an identity. That activity is helping them to form an identity as, as a conservationist or someone who believes in protecting the ocean or it's deepening their, their already nascent identity um, as someone who cares about the ocean that way. So those types of activities are, are incredibly helpful. Um, on a related note, we had a comment come in about uh, zoos and aquariums were a place where people come to a meet and there's a the home field advantage. And one thing, Robert, that I don't know if we shared with you actually in reporting is because we did paper exit surveys so we could get a lot of people really fast, which was a lesson learned for us. 
um, the number, we asked people to choose a proxy for one of the mindsets. We didn't say which mindset are you, but we asked them to choose. And the, the number of people that chose more than one was interesting because we, you know, like, why are you here today? Primarily to spend time with family, to experience sights and sounds of the oceans, et cetera. Animals was 90%, I think, Noah, of what people. So when in doubt, start with the animals. And there's great work that I know Jim, who had a question earlier, uh, Kathy and Khalil and others have done on empathy with animals and that empathetic response. And then allowing people to share their own because they're gonna expect the zoo and what we're seeing is they kind of expect the zoos and aquariums are about the animals. And, it, and it, there was a common connection with the, the animals. Um, one last one here, I don't know uh, if you guys are gonna be able to answer this and it may be a little more of a follow-up, but it's another one about uh, gnocchi, uh, which is familiar, familiarity with gnocchi's research on cultural models and about that, uh, if you could speak to that from your perspective. I don't know if we have, how much familiarity you have with that, Robert. Uh, I, I don't, but okay. again, it sounds very fascinating and, and I'm a geek for this stuff, so would love to be, um, to learn more about it. Well, with that, um, let me say, uh, it sounds like there's a great opportunity to connect folks from Yoki into those trainings that Robert pointed out earlier and uh, connect some of the dots because we all learning from these different research efforts. Um, I know these are really uh, tough and trying times for all of us, both pro professionally and personally. Uh, I really want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this webinar will be has been recorded. Uh, thanks to Robert for helping me out there. Um, and uh, we'll share that out as well. And just most important, we hope you all uh, stay uh, as well and as safe as possible. And uh, may we all be reopened soon and welcoming visitors back so we can put more of these uh, good lessons learned into practice. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. Nice to see uh, so many people were able to do so. And uh, until September 4th. Uh, thanks again, Noah and Robert. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Be well.